Hi, I'm Mio Mamada Fis and I won US and 3 minute thesis competition last year under the engineering category. Firstly, I would like to congratulate all of you for participating in this year's competition. I hope you guys use this chance wisely to boost your confidence in science communication so that you can effectively share your knowledge with everyone. Best wishes from me and good luck. Assalamu alaikum everyone, this is Samia Riaz from TPSG, last year's winner for the 3MT thesis competition for the science category. All those guys who are participating this year, you guys can do it because you guys are already a winner. So just be relaxed, stay calm, and be confident in yourself because your PhD is your expertise. So just try to give the best on your end and leave the rest to Allah because Allah is the planet. Assalamu alaikum and good morning to everyone. Welcome to USM Virtual 3 Minute Thesis Competition 2023. Welcome. <laughs> I'm Ana Masara Binti Ahmad Motal from the School of Industrial Technology. And together with me today, we have Aza Ismail from the School of Pharmaceutical Sciences, USM. So both of us will be the MC for today's competition. So just a quick question, Aza. Mm -hmm. So how are you excited for today? Oh, to be honest, Anna. This is the second time I have involved with three minute thesis competition. However, mm -hmm. thank you for trusting me. Frankly speaking, I'm still quite nervous today, but um, I can't wait to hear all the presentations from excellent USM students from all around the world. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, USM has made it through as one of Malaysia's representatives last two years to mm -hmm. compete uh, at the international level in Australia. Well done, USM minions. I assume some of you are familiar with this competition as USM has hosted the same program in previous years. Yes, Azza. Now we are in our eight years mm -hmm. and same like last year, this mm -hmm. year, three minute thesis competition will be hosted virtually mm. through two major social media platforms, which are the first one through RPS YouTube and, and the second one Facebook. through Facebook. Yes. Mm. So I'm hoping everyone will stay tuned and mm -hmm. don't forget to cheer for your school. So now, mm -hmm. without further delay, I would like to invite the Dean of Institute Postgraduate Studies, which is Yang Berbahagia, Professor Dr. Azlan Abdul Aziz, to give his welcoming remarks. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Greetings to distinguished deans, directors, and deputy deans, to USM staff, supervisors, and lecturers, to students, and to our outstanding contestant of three minutes thesis competition. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to University Science Malaysia 3 Minutes Thesis Competition, which is an annual event organized by Institute of Postgraduate Studies, USM, and supported by the Malaysian Council of Postgraduate Deans. Thank you for availing yourself to attend and be a part of this momentous event today via online platform. Ladies and gentlemen, the USM 3 Minutes Thesis Competition is a significant event to us as it brings together our outstanding doctoral research students across different disciplines to explain the research within three minutes to a general audience. The competition is also celebrates discoveries made by our doctoral research students as they explore various scientific solutions to multifarious national and global problems such as climate change, food security, mental illness, and corruptions, and many others. Ladies and gentlemen, to the Institute of Postgraduate Studies, the competition is most important as it promotes skill development in science communication by encouraging students to consolidate their ideas and crystallize their research discoveries to engage a non-specialist audience. The competition also provides a bridge between scientific literature as a professional medium of scientific research and the realms of reality as experience in the society. Ladies and gentlemen, so here we are for the USM 3 Minutes thesis competition to witness our great doctoral students to share their ideas and scientific findings to solve national and global problems in three minutes. 
This year, we have 35 contestants across three major categories, namely science, social science, and engineering and technology. To all the three empty contestants, I wish you all all the best. Please make full use of your three minutes and amaze us with your research ideas and solutions. May the spirit of scientific inquiries cross disciplinary research culture and appreciation remains through this USM 3MT competition. Thank you. Thank you to Professor Dr. Azlan Abdul Aziz for the encouraging speech. Well, everyone, we know all of you can't wait to cheer for your school representative. But before that, let me briefly introduce about what is 3-Minute Thesis Competition or also known as 3MT. So 3MT is a research communication competition founded by the University of Queensland, Australia in 2008. And briefly, this program challenged PhD students to present a compelling oration on their thesis topic and its significance in just three minutes. Although it's a short time, but for those who understand well enough about their research topic, they will be able to talk about the, their research in this short time. And interestingly, okay, for this year, we have 35 contenders and all of them are PhD students from various schools in USM. And these 35 contenders are further divided into three main categories, which are the first one, engineering and technology, second one, social science, and lastly, a science category. All contenders will be evaluated by three respected judges. This panel and also the chief jury is Dr. Noor Azaria Kamaruzaman from National Poison Center. Then we have Professor Datuk Dr. Faizal Rafiq Muhammad Ali Khan from the School of Electrical and Electronic Engineering. And lastly, we have Professor Dr. Jamila Ahmad from the School of Communication. Okay, now I assume you have a brief idea about this program and also the charges. But how about the house rules? It is the same as previous years, but since we are now conducting the competition online, some of the rules have been amended. So, for this year, the rules are First, the presentation is limited only to 3 minutes maximum and presentations exceeding 3 minutes are disqualified. Secondly, the presentation is to be spoken only in words. For example, no poems, no raps and no songs. Thirdly, the 3 minutes start as the student commences either via movement or speech. And lastly, it is the same for all competitions where the judge's decision is final with no negotiation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let us now begin our competition of University Science Malaysia 3-Minute Thesis Competition 2023 with the first category which is the Engineering and Technology Domain. The first one is from the School of Materials and Mineral Resources Engineering. Please welcome Ahmed Hafid Muhammad with his presentation entitled Response of Bone, like cells towards DCPD, coated beta TCP, and low crystallinity beta TCP porous scaffold. The floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, bone remodeling is a complex process. The large bone defects area remains a critical challenge in orthopedic surgeons. Various types of materials have been used as a scaffold and granules to increase the healing of bone defects area. And amongst these types of materials, calcium phosphate, widely used in clinics and hospitals, especially beta tricalcium phosphate, due to their, to their good osteoconductivity, resorbability, and biocompatibility. However, the resorption and the new bone formation rate of porous beta tricalcium phosphate granules uh, or scaffolds implanted in the large defects area are still inferior to natural bone. 
That's due to numerous reasons, including high solubility, high crystallinity, or the distribution, distribution of pore sizes inside the porous structure. Therefore, our idea was to fabricate new porous beta tricalcium granules with different pore and granular sizes. Why? Because the pore, size, the pore sizes are very important for the um, pore like cells especially for osteoclast and osteoblast that's responsible on the resorption and uh, new bone formation. Then these porous granules were coated with dicalcium phosphate dehydrate one of calcium phosphate group to increase the calcium and phosphate ions re releasing inside the bones. Of course, that will be very helpful for bone like cells. So based on these fabrications, we will fabricate a new scaffold contains dicalcium phosphate dehydrate and beta tricalcium phosphate dehydrate and possess both macro and micro pore sizes. So it will be very helpful for bone like cells responses. Furthermore, we will convert this kind of a scaffold of DCBD beta TCB to low crystallinity beta TCB porous granule uh, scaffolds. Why? Of course, this will. will Converted by identify a new method. So why we will fabricate low crystallinity because we want to increase the calcium and phosphate ions inside the bone. So finally, we will evaluate the bone like cell responses towards these two kinds of scaffolds fabricated by seeding MC3 T3 E1 uh, pre osteoblast on these types of scaffolds. Thank you, Ahmad Hafiz. The research focuses on the fabrications of beta-TCP and low crystallinity beta-TCP porous scaffolds and how the bone-like cells respond towards them. The micro and micropores formations of these scaffolds play a major role in osteoconductivity and stimulate cells to adhesion and proliferate in the bone remodeling process. Thank you, Ahmad Hafiz for the enlightening talk. Good luck. Now, let's call upon Alexander Tan Wai Ting from the School of Mechanical Engineering with his presentation entitled Effect of Error Augmentation Training Strategy on Engagement in Rehabilitation Therapy. Everyone, please welcome Alexander. Imagine the world where stroke rehabilitation isn't just a necessary process, but an enjoyable and engaging journey. Today, I'm excited to share with you a creative approach that combines gaming and technology to transform the way stroke patients recover. Stroke is a leading cause of disability and death worldwide. Every year, millions of people suffer a stroke, and many of them are left with long-term physical and cognitive impairments. Stroke rehabilitation therapy can help people to recover from these impairments. It is a crucial phase in a patient's recovery journey. However, traditional methods that focus on repetitive movement often lack engagement and have no clear insights into their recovery progress, leading to demotivation, frustration, and high dropout rates. But wait, what if rehabilitation could be fun? That's the question that drove my research. In my study, I have developed a gaming system that allows patients to strengthen their core muscles while immersing themselves in interactive games. Yes, you heard that right. Gaming for rehabilitation. Serious games are games that are designed to be both entertaining and purposeful, and they can be used to target specific rehabilitation goals. Here's how it works. Our system incorporates a custom-developed force plate that measures a patient's center of pressure in sitting position. This data becomes the magic wand that controls the game, making the experience not only enjoyable but also effective and meaningful. Beyond the gaming excitement, we collect precious data during the gameplay, such as the data about how the patients move and how they balance themselves. This data, combined with the game scores, goes beyond entertainment. It fuels a machine learning or statistical model that trains to predict a patient's recovery outcome. 
bringing all these elements together, our CSGN system isn't just a concept. It's a reality that's transforming the landscape of stroke rehabilitation. Through our experiment and clinical trials, we have witnessed firsthand the impact it can have. Both physiotherapists and stroke patients loved it. The smiles, the engagement, and the positive feedback all affirm that we are onto something truly meaningful. Our serious game system bridges the gap between technology and healthcare, transforming rehabilitation into a journey that's not just about boring exercises, but about bringing joy and progress to the patients on their journey to recovery. This system is not just about playing games. It's about playing a vital role in the stroke patient's life. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Alexander, for a very interesting talk. It is great to know that the research focuses on revolutionizing stroke rehabilitation by combining gaming and technology. So, through the custom developed uh, serious game system, patients straighten core muscles while immersed in interactive games. So this approach addresses the lack of engagement and progress awareness in traditional methods, offering an innovative and enjoyable alternative to recovery. I wish you all the best. So, ladies and gentlemen, coming up next is Anis Natasha Shafawi, representing the School of Chemical Engineering with her presentation entitled Development of Empty Fruit Punch, Derived Biochar and Its Modification via Sonication. Metal deposition and a main functionalization for carbon dioxide capture. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear from her. Carbon dioxide or CO2 has been pointed out as one of the greenhouse gases that lead to the extreme climate change, namely global warming together with other developing countries such as Singapore and Indonesia, Malaysia is responsible for approximately 40% to the global CO2 emission. Due to the pressure in reducing the global warming, many industrial companies around the world have enforced to control the release of the CO2 emission to the atmosphere, such as by utilizing carbon capture and storage CCS technologies. Here, absorption of CO2 can be done by using adsorbate. With the abundance of organic waste, or known as biomass, this allows for the synthesis of porous carbon adsorbent, or known as biochar. However, the pristine biochar suffer from low microporosity and poor surface chemistry that limits the CO2 absorption. So, how are we going to tackle this problem? Considering that oil palm plantation is the largest agricultural sector in Malaysia, oil palm waste, such as empty fruit bunch or EFB, can be used as the perfect biomass to be converted into biochar. In this study, several treatments were performed, which are sonication, NGO deposition, and also amine functionalization. Based on the extensive characterizations, it was proven that the modified biochar has a higher CO2 capture compared to the pristine biochar due to the higher microporosity that lead to the feces option and the presence of magnesium oxide or NGO that contributed to the carbonate formation and also the presence of nitrogen functional groups that enhance the surface basicity of the biochar and form the Lewis acid base interaction. In conclusion, this study can be based, can be the uh, knowledge for us that the empty fruit bunch derived biochar can be used as an adsorbent for CO2 capture. This will, of course, um, improve the air quality and also benefits the society. Thank you, Anis, for a mind blowing talk. It is refreshing to learn something new here. This research works on the modifications of empty fruit punch derived biochar for the purpose of carbon dioxide capture. Several modifications are performed which are sonication, magnesium oxide, deposition and amine functionalization. 
So, results reveal that the modified biochar has a higher carbon dioxide capture due to the improved physicochemical properties. Good luck, Anis. Moving on, please welcome our next contestant from the School of Chemical Engineering, Chia Yi Tong, with her presentation entitled Biofilm Evolvement, a City of Microalgae. Everyone, please welcome Chia Yi Tong. Do you know that microalgae and human are sharing a similar need to claim a place as a home? Human build houses. Microalgae, they build biotone. Human houses are made of steels and concrete. Microalgae biotone is made up of extracellular polymer substance EPS, which consists of carbohydrates and protein. House serve as a protection from rain and sunshine for humans. Various biofilm protect the microalgae from extreme pH changes and environmental stress. Since the biofilm is so crucial for the microalgae survival, hence my research study will be shed some light onto its purpose and function of the biofilm. Generally, I will be looking into two different aspects, which is Number one, the developments of biofilm. As the saying goes, Rome wasn't built in a day. Microalgae do take some time to form the biofilm. Typically, they have to undergo a series of phase of formation starting from the cell absorption, followed by the secretions of the EBS to stabilize themselves under the solid support. However, over time, the biofilm will mature and disperse at the end of the cycles. The biofilm growth phase is very complicated and keep changing, especially the interactions between the biofilm cells and the solid support. Therefore, my second invention is to study number two, the interactions between the biofilm cells and the solid support. After the identifications of the EBS compositions in the biofilm, it is not difficult anymore to describe the biofilm additions in terms of some fundamental interacting force, such as vulnerable force and electrostatic force. In general, different proportions between the carbohydrates and proteins in the EBS could result in various bonding strengths of the biofilms to the solid supports. It eventually would enable me to predict how fast the algae adhesion will be on the different solid support, and also to develop control strategy from the microalgae attachments. Eventually, the knowledge gained from these solutions would contribute to a large-scale microalgae cultivation system for biofuels and also pharmaceutical compounds productions. Therefore, it highlights the importance of my research topic study, which is about the biofilm involvement, a city of microbiology. Thank you. Thank you, Chai Tong. Such an impressive talk. Basically, the research is about microalgae, or popular renewable resources for wide spectrum of bioproducts. Hence, this research highlights a novel cultivation method of microalgae, which is immobilized biofilm. It aims to delve into the diversified properties of microalgae biofilm to understand the underlying theories and unique interactions between the cells and solid supports. So, Xia Yitong, I wish you all the best in your research. Ladies and gentlemen, our next contestant for the engineering category is Haruna Abdu from the School of Computer Sciences. The title of his talk is clean and sustainable environment with deep learning. Haruna Abdu, the floor is yours. Increase in domestic waste is causing a growing confine into the soil. Improper garbage or waste depositions and or management contaminate the environment, both land, air and water causing a serious life threatening issues to all the living things in all the living spaces. Like in the case of humans, especially younger children and elderly individuals. 
have a greater chances of being infected. However, there exist a lot of researchers that propose a series of solutions, but their solution is not economical and is not generalized, as most of them make use of synthesized images to train their model, and some of them make use of real-life images with a clear background. That can never represent or work perfectly in a real time, such as the images in a complex situations like the one in the top left corner of this figure. That is where our research comes in. We leverage on the deep learning technology and proposed a model that was trained based on those complex situation images that can work in a real time and in any irrespective of any lighting and condition. In addition to that, our solution didn't stop there, but we can leverage on smartphones, CCTV cameras, still cameras that can work perfectly with our solutions. In addition to that also, our solution is contributing in solving climate change and food insecurity. Thank you. Thank you, Haruna Abdu, for a very intriguing talk. Such interesting research, actually. This research develops a deep learning model to detect and classify domestic waste in image capture in the wild aiming to reduce environmental contamination, injuries, death to living things, and mitigate food insecurity, climate change, etc. All the best, Haruna Abdu. Next is from the School of Chemical Engineering. Please welcome Manjula Subramaniam with her presentation entitled Sulfur Dioxide Catalytic Thermal Reduction to Elemental Sulfur Over Eggshells Derived Calcium Based Catalyst. The floor is yours. A very good day to the panels, and I am Manjula Subramaniam here to present my three minute thesis presentation entitled Sulfur Dioxide Catalytic Thermal Reduction to Elemental Sulfur Over Eggshells Derived Calcium Based Catalyst. With an elevation of modern technology, sulfur dioxide can be emitted by various ways like oil refineries and metallurgy processes, fossil fuel vehicles, burning of sulfur contaminated fossil fuel in power plants and industries. It shows that exposures to a concentration of 2 ppm of sulfur dioxide will cause irritations, choking and coughing, whereas exposures from 400 to 500 ppm of sulfur dioxide will re result in fast life-threatening conditions. One of the commercialized way of reducing sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere generally is through flue gas desulfurization process, which shows up to 90% of sulfur dioxide removal efficiency. However, an additional waste treatment area in, is established to treat a vast amount of secondary pollutants or byproducts produced. Hence, this research gap gives me a golden opportunity to focus on my PhD research on this title. The reduction process is much preferred due to its various advantages as it is in product is in solid form. Sulfur shows its suitability for storage and long-term and distance transportation. The operation and management cost of waste could be reduced because the sulfur generated has marketable value. Meanwhile, no additional space is allocated to treat the waste. Calcium oxide from chicken eggshells was chosen due to reducing to elemental sulfur because of its higher availability with lower cost. The process is varied in terms of gas holding space velocity GHSV and stability test is conducted to determine the activity of catalyst throughout the reaction. Three phases were involved during the reaction which initially converts calcium oxide to calcium sulfate followed by calcium sulfide formation and finally sulfur formation by following sulfur dioxide and hydrogen gases. The cyclic system is shown and it is clearly shows that catalyst is regenerable. Analysis of this experiment is with the performance of gas chromatography, thermal conductivity detector GCTCD, 
in determining the amount of sulfur dioxide reduced by catalyst to elemental sulfur during the reduction process. Thank you. Thank you, Manjula. Her research is to reduce sulfur dioxide to elemental sulfur with the aid of calcium oxide nanoparticles from chicken eggshells. A cyclic system is used for the reduction process and the catalyst is regenerated. Thank you, Manjula, for the, for the enlightening talk. Good luck. Now, let's call upon Neha Han from the School of Electrical and Electronic Engineering with her presentation entitled Equalization of Cell Voltage in a Battery Pack Using Active Cell Balancing. Everyone, please welcome Neha Han. electric vehicle industry is rapidly growing as people shift towards more sustainable transportation option. EV runs on the battery pack which consists of multiple individual cells grouped together. For example, when cells are combined in series, the voltage values get added up. And cells are combined in parallel, the current gets added up. You can imagine connecting many cells in series is like mounting many horses to a carrier. If all or all the horses run at the same speed, the carrier will be driven with a maximum efficiency. Out of four horses, if one horse runs slowly, the other three horses has to reduce their speed, thus reducing the efficiency. And if one horse runs faster, it would eventually hurt itself by pulling the load of other three horses. Similarly, when four cells are connected in series, the voltage values of all the four cells should be equal to drive battery pair with the maximum efficiency. This method of maintaining all cell voltages to be equal is called as cell balance. The question arises, uh, the question arises is what causes the cell imbalance in the battery pack. When battery pack is charging or discharging, cell get unbalanced due to their individual internal resistances, temperature and charging and discharging capacities. The two most common methods of cell balancing are active balancing and passive balancing. The active balancing has more advantages over the passive balancing. By using active cell balancing, we can redistribute the charge among the cells to maximize the efficiency of the battery pack. Thus results in increasing voltage of EV in a single charge. In my work, I am performing active cell balancing by integrating artificial intelligence to minimize the time required for all cell voltage to be equal. Moreover, I am also considering the effect of climate condition such as temperature on the cell characteristics. The result of my study concludes that we can improve the cell balancing efficiency so that EV can cover more distance in one go. Thank you. Thank you, Neha, for a very interesting talk. It is great to know that the aim of her research is to provide solution to EV in terms of cost and EV range, reducing balancing time by performing cell balancing. By performing active cell balancing in battery pack, so we can improve the EV's range and reducing the balancing time. So that EV can cover more distance in shorter time. Wow, very interesting. I wish you all the best, Neha. Coming up next, is Noor Huda Ismail representing the School of Materials and Mineral Resources Engineering with her presentation entitled Can an eco-friendly bio-L composite modified with zirconia and alumina be a dental restoration? Advanced Dental Material Engineering, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear from her. There's a poem in Malay. Literally, it means that grandmother has all her teeth of the aged. How wonderful as people age, they can still enjoy vigorous health. 
Let's go back to the time when people were familiar with gold restoration. Not only that, Etruscan introduced fashionable dangerous made of animal and human teeth. Yes, numerous innovations were made to achieve a sustainable goal of healthy life. Amalgam is civil color restoration that was widely used. However, due to concerns on aesthetics and toxicity, tooth color restoration, particularly dental composite, has become popular. Dental composite comprises of filler particles dispersed with a resin matrix to form a cross-linked polymer. Silica, zirconia, and alumina are filler particles, and the resin are bexma, tegma, and utma. Hence, the aim of study focused on the effect of silica extracted from rice husks, zirconia, and alumina on physical and mechanical properties to serve better for dental applications. Adding a saline couple agent and a litter for the initiator helps to fabricate an ideal hybrid bioal composite. The hybrid bioal composite is used to cement the crowns, bridges, and veneers. For this reason, an optimal ratio of filler resin is required. Rice is one of the world's primary crops, approximately 1% of the entire surface. Rice has is an every source of silica. Previously, a dental composite was made of only silica. With a modification by adding zirconia and alumina, the results are promising. This modification was characterized to confirm surface modification of filler particles using advanced machines such as a scanner electron microscope and a Fourier transfer infrared spectroscopy. Its filling thickness, diameter transfer strength, compressive strength, and micro hardness show improvement, which indicates a good of dispersion and stress distribution during forced apply. A deeper study on surface morphology of hybrid bioal composite and fractographic analysis confirm that the optimum ratio of resin filler with reduced void contain. The hybrid bioal composite may affect their toxicity towards living tissues. For this reason, the bioincompatibility of the material was further studied. The cytotoxicity of the material was measured using a MTT assay based on a mitochondrial activity. There was minimal and no cytotoxicity observed. These findings support the potential longevity and biocompatibility of hybrid bioal composite, which is reinforced with zirconia and alumina. Thank you. Thank you, Norhuda, for a mind-blowing talk. It's refreshing to learn something new here. Dental cement made from silica rice husks reinforced with zirconia and alumina may carry improved physical and mechanical properties. This study aims to characterize fillers, use and investigate the physical and mechanical properties and the cytotoxicity of a hybrid bioal composite. The hybrid bioal composite is a potential dental cement. Good luck, Norhuda. Moving on, please welcome our next contestant from the School of Computer Sciences, Nur Izati Abukadir, with her presentation entitled Determining the Effects of Climate Change on Depressive Patients Using Long Short Term Memory Approach. Everyone, please welcome Nur Izati. Hello everyone, do you still remember what happened in our country in December last year? During that time, adults shouting for help, children crying hungrily and cold. It was a massive flood that happened December last year, which caused many people to be trapped in that incident. Not only in Malaysia, there was also a massive flood that happened in Pakistan last year which caused damage to this beautiful country. Ladies and gentlemen, all these are examples of climate change effects that happen around us, which related to the increasing of global temperatures. Most of us know that the increase in temperature could affect humans physically, but do you know that the temperature rising also can affect humans mentally, especially for depressive patients? Research shows that the temperature rising could increase the hospital admission of depressive patients. However, 
the relationship is not clear yet and needs further investigation. Factors such as age and residency also might play a role in determining the relationship. The previous researchers tried to solve this problem using time series analysis. However, they only focus on examining the relationship and do not involve forecasting. So, this is where my research comes in with the aim to design and evaluate time series model to formulate the relationship between temperature rising towards hospital admission of depressive patients and to forecast the increasing rate of depressive patients admission to the hospital. First, this research involves two types of data which are meteorological data and hospital admission data. These two types of data will be combined into a single data store to process further. Then, AI-based deep learning model called Long Short Term Memory LSTM model is developed to formulate the relationship between temperature rising, age and residency towards hospital admission of depressive patients. This research not only stops here but also provides forecasting of hospital admission for depressive patients. Therefore, again, LSCM is used with a combination with hidden Markov model to ensure feasibility of the results. In conclusion, the expected implication of this study is a state-of-art deep learning approach that able to formulate and alert the impact of climate change on depressive patients that can help the authorities to prepare for the countermeasure and cooling procedure. Thank you. Thank you, Izati. Such an impressive talk. Basically, the research is about the aim to propose an enhanced deep learning model to formulate and alert the impact of temperature rising on depressive patients considering the factors such as age and residency. So, Izati, I wish you all the best in your research. So, our final contestant for the engineering and technology category is Thulfikar Chabar Abdul Abnawi, also from the School of Computer Sciences. The title of his talk is Mobile Advanced Persistent Threat Mitigation Based Hardware Resource Usage Behavior. Thulfikar, the floor is yours. I think all of you carry a smartphone in your pockets. Did you hear about financial scam? Financial scam is a cyber threat that fish the target and get confidential data. Based on statistics, number of phishing attacks is increasing year by year. The impact of this attack is loss of organization, reputation, economy, and productivity. Phishing attack is different than spare phishing. Phishing attack targets everyone, while spare phishing targets specific victims. From 2015 to 2018, a cyber spionage toolkit called Zupac targeted Middle East countries and infected Android devices by using spare phishing attack through a Telegram channel. These attacks collect most of the information. One of cyber threats that I keen to present is advanced persistent threats. ABT is malicious, multi step, with hard to detect tactic, technique, and procedure that target specific companies for long-term network access. These threats are hard to detect due to lack of attack profiling or TTP. APT fingerprint means a fine-grained attack path utilized by APT to achieve the final attack goal. These threats have begun focusing on smartphone devices instead of computer due to tremendous amount of sensitive information generated from these devices. In addition, the smartphone nature such as mobility, heterogeneous network, and limited resources, this lead to the fact that lack of security solutions embedded in these devices to defend against APT. As a result, securing this sensitive information on these devices faced a huge challenge. Therefore, my research is focusing on mitigating advanced persistent threat on smartphone devices based on hardware resource usage by proposing a framework based on cyber situation awareness called OODA, observe, orient, decide, and act model, that cope with the complexity of this threat. This framework 
support a continuous monitoring of these activities, APT activities, and help security analysts to make precise decisions based on adaptive evaluation of risk and trust. Finally, this framework will be evaluated in terms of usability, security mechanism, and effectiveness. Thank you, Sophika, for a very intriguing talk. Such interesting research, actually. It is all about on mitigating advanced persistent threats, APT, on smartphone devices by proposing a framework-based OODA, Object, Orient, Decide and Act, loop that supports continuous monitoring of complex APT activities and makes precise decisions based on adaptive evaluation of risk and trust model. All the best, Thurfikar. So now, we finish the first category, which is Engineering and Technology for today. We'll have a short break before continuing to our next category, which is Social Sciences. Azar, we will now move to our next category, which is social science. But before we move on, it's good to share with everyone here that the top three contenders from today's competition 
will represent USM at the national level. And those that won the national level will then represent Malaysia at the international level in Australia. So we will start this session with our first participant, which is Aishatu Muhammad Usman from Center for Islamic Development Management Studies. She will present her research entitled The Effect of Corporate Governance, Sharia Governance and Risk Management on Performance of Islamic Banks in Africa. Without further ado, please welcome Aishatu. Imagine a bank that does not charge or pay interest, does not invest in harmful or unethical businesses, and does not engage in speculative or risky businesses. This is not a fantasy, but a reality for millions of people who use Islamic banking services in Africa and around the globe. Islamic banking is a form of ethical and interest-free banking that adheres to Sharia principle, which has become a contemporary topic of discussion due to an ending global financial crisis. Islamic banking in Africa has been in existence for decades, but its performance is the lowest among all regions. Why is this so? My research intends to answer this question by examining three factors that influence the performance of Islamic banks in Africa, which includes corporate governance, Sharia governance, and risk management. Corporate governance are rules and practices that ensure accountability and transparency in corporate institutions. And Sharia governance refers to mechanisms in Islamic-based institutions that ensure compliance with ethical and religious standards. While risk management refers to strategies that Islamic banks employ to mitigate the unique risk they encounter. I use panel data from 2015 to 2020 for 28 Islamic banks across 10 African countries to evaluate the performance of Islamic banks in Africa. I use correlational research design to determine the relationship between the variables. Data were gathered from secondary sources using banks' financial statements and use the generalized method of moment to estimate a panel regression model that measures the performance of Islamic banks. According to the findings of my analysis, corporate governance, Sharia governance, and risk management have a significant effect on performance of Islamic banks in Africa. Specifically, I discovered that having a suitable board size and independent board members can enhance corporate governance. In addition, having a competent and independent Sharia board can facilitate effective Sharia governance. Furthermore, developing effective strategies to manage liquidity and Sharia risk can improve risk management. My research indicates that enhancing governance and risk management practices of Islamic banks can enhance their performance and contribute to sustainable economic growth and financial stability in Africa. The findings also emphasize Islamic banking potential as an alternative uh, to ethical form of finance. My research contributes to the literature of Islamic banking and finance in Africa by providing empirical evidence and insights into the performance determinants of these institutions. It also has implications for policymakers regulators, managers, investors, customers, and other parties interested in promoting Islamic banking in Africa as an instrument for financial inclusion, social justice, and economic development. Thank you, Aishatu. So briefly, her study will provide a valuable perspective on the state of Islamic banking in Africa, which highly emphasize the significance of corporate governance, Sharia compliance, and also risk management. Next, let's welcome Aratai Din Ek from the School of Distant Education to share her research about Unlocking Your Writing Magic, Transforming Open Distant Learning with Awesome Screencast Feedback. Hi everyone, over my nine years of experience as an ODL instructor, I have noticed that many ODL learners face difficulties with writing. They often complain that the feedback received was general and left them feeling lost and unsure about how to improve their writing. And one common issue is the lack of personalized feedback. So, as educators, we want to provide the best learning experience, but with limited time and resources, offering individualized feedback 
on writing assignments can be a real talent. Well, this is what my PhD project would like to address. Now, here comes the magic screencast video feedback. It is a method of providing feedback using recorded screen captures video such as ScreenPal, Jing, Loom, and etc. The screencast captures the instructor's computer screen as they demonstrate or explain a concept. Now, imagine this. You submit your writing assignment and instead of receiving a one-size-fit-all response, your instructor send you a personal video. Address your name, walking you through your work, highlighting the strengths, and offering specific suggestions for improvement. It's like having a virtual writing course right beside you, cheering you on how would you feel that. When I first introduced screencast video feedback to my ODL students, the results were amazing. One of my students, let's call her Lisa, she was struggling with narrative, structure and character development. With tech-based feedback, she seemed discouraged and it was hard for her to see where she went wrong. So, I decided to try out the screencast approach. I recorded a short video discussing her story strength, pointing out areas that needed refinement, and even sharing examples of how she could enhance her characters in depth. Lisa's reaction was priceless. She felt so much more connected to the feedback and the learning process as a whole. Not only she addressed the specific issues I pointed out, but she also started experimenting with her writing style, becoming more confident and creative. Her subsequent assignments show remarkable improvement. Now, you might wonder, is this method time-consuming for instructors? I won't sugarcoat it. Creating personalized video does require some effort. But trust me, it's worth it. Thank you. Thank you, Aratai. I believe that by incorporating screencast video feedback will greatly benefit all the learners within the open distance learning. I look forward to your success. Next, let's welcome Jiao Yu Ling from the School of Language Literacy and Translation to present her work entitled Domba Script in the Linguistic Landscape in the Old Time of Lijiang. What we are looking at now is Dumba script, the last pictograph still in use in the world. As an endangered language in China, it appears solely in the Lijiang area. When I had a travel to the old town of Lijiang several years ago, I found that Dumba script appears frequently on public signs, sometimes alone, sometimes along with other languages such as Chinese, English, and Japanese, and other minority languages. As a language learner, I can't help wondering how many languages are there indeed on the public signs, and what's the visibility of Dumba scripts among all the languages displayed. As the first step, I choose an equivalence of 16 streets in the old town as the surveying area, and secondly, I took photographs of all the visual signs in the selected areas. Any sign with a spatial framework was recognized as a unit of analyze. Each and every sign was tagged as private or public, bilingual, monolingual, or multilingual. Any language at the top or in the central part of a sign with the biggest size was identified as the preferred language. Finally, all the data collected was proceeded with software to obtain frequency and percentage of language distributions on different types of signs. As for the visibility of Dumba script, it was analyzed from three levels, namely the total number of its appearance, its appearance as a preferred language, 
and its appearance as the only language on signs. It shows that Chinese is the dominant language in that area, and English is the most used foreign language. While Dongba script as the written language of the local minority enjoys a high visibility but has a rather low autonomy on public signs. Up to now, it's only part of my PhD project. In my future study, I hope to go deeper into the relationship between the visibility of Dumba script and its language vitality. I believe it is of great importance to the preservation and maintenance of the dying language. Thank you, Zhao Yuling. And just to recap, her research explained the intricate relationship between language and society, which is highly influenced by various factors such as social status and also power dynamic. We will now proceed with Li Xingyun from the School of Educational Studies to share her work about framework to investigate Chinese preschooler English foreign language learning attitudes and the parents in promoting learning. Hello everyone, my name is Li Qingyun. I'm from the School of uh, Educational Studies, University of Science, Malaysia. Today I'm very happy to share with you my research topic. My research topic is about preschoolers' English as a foreign language learning in China and the parents in promoting their learning. So, do you think the preschoolers can describe or explain their feelings? Or do you think the preschoolers have their own personalities about their interest in learning something? So my research, uh, my research topic and uh, is focused on preschoolers about their attitudes. Why did I choose this topic? Because in China, most of the parents are very eager to their child to learn English because the parents think the earlier the better of learning a second language or a foreign language. However, with the new policy in China, the Chinese government abandoned the Chinese preschoolers to learn English before they go to primary school because they think the children will have lots of the abundance of However, the parents can still want their child to learn English. That's why they have to teach the child at home. But the preschooler find that the children have the negative attitudes towards the unqualified English foreign language learning provisions at home. So this research, I will use the unicode math named Elixit Mosphere Analysis to excite the preschoolers' attitudes towards English learning. This atmosphere will use the different pictures to elicit the preschoolers about the perspectives. perspectives. For example, can you imagine if I ask the child and I show a picture, this picture is a chocolate. I ask the child, do you like English? And if the child choose the picture like the chocolate, the child will say, I think learning English like eating chocolate because chocolate is very sweet. And if I ask the child, I think learning English so writing the English vocabulary is like a tiger without ti because tiger is very scared. I don't like learning English so writing in the English alphabet. Using this elixir atmosphere, I can find I found out that the preschoolers prefer learning English through watching TV, singing the songs, interacting with their parents, and playing the games in English contents. And they dislike learning English story or reciting English vocabularies or writing English alphabets. This research I hope to give the parents the Good suggestions on how to teach the child and cultivate the child interested about the English learning at home. This is my research. Thanks for your listening. Okay, thank you, Ling Xingyun. I believe your research will give added value to preschoolers' English learning attitude, especially at home, and this will later on impact China education system. We will continue with the fifth speaker, which is Li Rui from the Center for Instructional Technology and Multimedia. She will share her research entitled Knowledge Atlas Analysis of Teaching Repository 
under the blended learning environment in CNKI based on SciSpace. As a beginner moving towards in-depth research, I have set my sights on the field of teaching repositories. From the, from the People's Daily 2023 news, there are higher than 52,500 online courses in China, with 370 million registered users, and more than 330 million college students have obtained course credits. In the context, we find college students face challenging in accessing diverse and high-quality learning resources tailored for blended learning environment. Educators grapple with the demand for innovative and effective teaching resources that align with blended learning, adapt to evolving educational methodologies. Universities are confronted with the imperative to establish robust resource platforms. I chose active situation, important research base, knowledge platform, especially hot trends as my research objective keywords. I want to form the time distribution research institutions, cited journals and keywords atlas to find the answers. In this paper, CNKI, China National Knowledge Infrastructure is used as a data source to accurately match and retrieve the blended learning and uh, teaching repositories through the theme or keywords. And bibliometric analysis is carried out through scientists. From 2002 to 2022, we realized the uh, cited journals in the research of teaching repositories and the blended learning in China are discussed. In conclusion, first, from the time distribution of core papers published, the annual volume of papers generally shown a tendency increasing first and then decreasing. Secondly, from the perspective of the academic institutions where the foremost scholars are placed, demonstrate researchers are mainly distributed in vocational and teaching uh, technical colleges. Certainly from the extraordinary contributions of the papers, site papers, the core papers of the research are primarily distributed in educational journals. The last but not least, from the perspective of the future research trends, multimedia constructivism, virtual reality and practical teaching will become the research trends in the future. Okay, thank you, Leroy. A snapshot of her research which used CNKI, China National Knowledge Infrastructure, as a data source to study blended learning and teaching repository in China. So next, let us welcome Ostava Shahla from the School of Social Sciences to present her research about grid as predictor of psychological capital, flourishing, self-reliance, and life satisfactions among university students, the role of resilience as mediators. I'm going to dive into a topic that is very important in our life. Everyone aims for success, but not everyone understands how to achieve it, or how can we become more successful, or how successful someone will be. Why are some people so productive from the others? Is it their intelligence, talent, luck, timing, or hardworking? Interestingly, in 2007, one characteristic emerged as a significant predictor of success. It wasn't a social intelligence, physical health, even IQ. It was greed. Greed is a passion and perseverance for every long-term goal. Greed is a having a stamina and also a sticking with your future day in and day out. Greed has demonstrated that it plays a very crucial role in academic and job success. In 2021, as I set out on my journey to pursue a PhD at USM, 
I was wondering which more positive factor grid could be predict for a, a student well-being and discover inner world in a collectivist society. I focus on a specific um, aspect like psychological capital, resilience, flourishing, self-reliance, and life satisfaction, which this factor play a significant role in a student success in life. I designed and developed a comprehensive model and conducting a survey involving about 500 Malaysian students from a public university. I have employed uh, various statistical, statistical tests and using a correlation and regression analysis. I explored that grit is a strong and positive, significant related to psychological um, capital, resilience, flourishing, self-reliance, and also life satisfaction. These findings suggested a good a starting point for a future research that can play to different areas of well-being. Attention to greed or a study on greed uh, holds a potential implication for a government, educators, parents, researchers to develop a strategy that fosters greed and improve overall well-being in a collectivist society. This, so far, the best thing I hear about greed is we need to be a greedy about getting your kids greeter. Thank you. Thank you, Ustava. So her study identified the significance of greed in promoting the well-being of students, carrying many meaningful implications not only to the counsellor and educators, but also to the institution as a whole. We will now proceed to Siti Mariam Benti Idris from Centre for Islamic Development Management Studies to share her research entitled Determinant Factors in Islamic Home Financing. Islamic home financing recorded lower value compared to conventional home loans in Malaysia as of 2023. However, Islamic home financing has potential to develop more and the awareness regarding Islamic banking services need to be enhanced and need more exposure in this country, Malaysia. Therefore, this research would like to investigate the factors determining Islamic home financing during long run, short run, and the grandeur causality relationship among the variables involved in these studies. Based on the result, in the long run estimation, through ARDL tests, total deposit, total asset and liabilities show significant relationship toward Islamic home financing during long run. These three variables are categorized into internal variables or internal factors for macroeconomic factors. Money supply and Islamic interbank money market shows a significant relationship to Islamic home financing in Malaysia. Among these variables, total deposit and total liabilities shows negative relationship to Islamic home financing in Malaysia during long run. For short run analysis, using ECM tests, total deposit and total asset are internal variables that have significant relationship to Islamic home financing in Malaysia whereas macroeconomic factors such as money supply is the only macroeconomic factors that has significant relationship to Islamic home financing in Malaysia. For grandeur causality test result, nine pairs of grandeur causal relationship found in this study. All of nine pairs are unidirection or the interpretation is one-way causal relationship towards each other. For instance, Islamic home financing has four one-way causal relationship towards four factors. Focus the other factors in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Siti Mariam. I believe that by identifying all the significant factors will influence the growth of Islamic home financing in Malaysia. And this later on will provide valuable insight into the dynamic of Islamic finance in our country. Next, let's welcome Vanestri Anaprompan Kasi from the School of Educational Studies. She will present her research about grid and game module in improving remedial pupil multiplication skill. How 
many of you can remember at least five phone number by your heart? Can you rattle off the digits whom you must call in an emergency? It turns out we no longer have very many numbers committed to memory. The lack of visual view of numbers prevent us from keeping that important information in our heads. Number sense in mathematics play a vital part in daily life. As we all know, mathematics is a compulsory subject in primary and secondary school in Malaysia. Even though it is important and needed in our daily life, there are many people who are still afraid of this subject. Well, please do imagine a well-dressed up nine years boy sitting on the last bench of the class with full of sadness and tears. I, as a teacher, witnessed that moment on the very first day of my posting. I wondered about the situation. I was informed that a particular boy had been punished because students need special help in process of learning. Without such help, they will fail to build self-confidence and will lose the excitement of exploring school life. If remedial students are continuously neglected, will lose interest and focus on learning, which may result in dropping out. Therefore, in my studies, I designed and developed a grid and game module for remedial peoples with fun elements underpinning Constructivity Theory by Jeremy Brunner and Self-Determination Theory which was proposed by Desi and Ryan in the year 1985. The grid and game module consists of a teacher manual with a lesson plan, people's activity book and an interactive game that helps the students to master the multiplication skill with great technique. With the assistance of a grid and game module, remedial pupils can solve multiplication problem. The effective teaching and learning tool and strategy is highly needed to achieve the learning outcome and to make sure no child left behind. Thank you, Vanesri. I hope by creating a comprehensive module that includes a teacher manual, student activity book and interactive game will demonstrate a dedicated effort to enhance student learning experience. All right, everyone, let us continue with the final presenter for this category, which is Zaib Un Nisa from Center for Islamic Development Management Studies. She will present about the effect of religiousness on terrorism affected government girls' primary school teachers in Pakistan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Across the world, terrorism and discrimination continue to prevent a large number of girls from attending to schools. It is a matter of disgrace that 132 million girls are already out of schools and have few opportunities to participate in the economic growth. This underutilization tactics of human capital is a parasite for sustainable growth in the dynamic world. Similarly, the insurgency of terrorism obscured the identity of girls in Pakistan with poor access to the education. Surprisingly, in the wake of terrorism, more than 60,000 schools have been operating without boundary walls and deprived of safety and security measures where female teachers are serving with minimum facilities and remunerations. There are many detours and dead ends in the life of female teachers, which cultivated their perceived job risk. But now it's high time for all of us to show moral courage and defend their rights for the sustainable growth. The present study witnessed that the protective properties of religiousness in the curbing of negative effects of perceived job risk. In the wake of terrorism and lack of perceived organizational support, religiousness is an acute source of support. This source can reopen many dysfunctional schools in Pakistan's far flung and risky areas. The present study contributes 
for the capacity building strategies for school female teachers who are serving interests of affected women girls primary schools. This research proposes to develop a framework for designing policies at a larger scale to reopen dysfunctional schools in far flung and risky areas of Pakistan. Finally, the school administration can revert the trust of female teachers to perform well even in challenging circumstances. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zaib. So as far as I understood, her study identified the job risk and the lack of organization support on female teachers in the context of terrorism. However, it's great to know that religiousness can mitigate all the negative impact and also promote the teacher well-being in Pakistan. So we have now finished with the second category. We will have a short break before continuing with the last category, which is science. And this session will be chaired by Azhar. The greatest threat to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. Sustainability is no longer an option. It is now an obligation. USM has the mission of transforming higher education for a sustainable tomorrow. With each step taken, USM will always lead the move in matters regarding sustainability. USM pioneers the path in implementing the Accelerated Program for Excellence, known as APEX. As the nation's sole APEX university, USM is placed fourth in the global world impact rankings. APEX supports intensive transdisciplinary research efforts which can empower communities. APEX transforms socioeconomic well-being. APEX empowers the strategic quadruple helix collaborative network. APEX gives rise to hebat talents that are prominent, excellent, and eminent. With each passing moment, there is continual aspiration to be the sustainability-led university. USM is committed towards advancing a sustainable future. Our home is not just USM. Our home is much bigger. Thank you, Anna, for the great session. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you again to the USM 2023 3MT Thesis Competition. Ladies and gentlemen, in this category of science, there will be 16 contenders which will be presenting the research in this field. These presentations will be divided into two rounds, where contestant 1 to 8 will be in the first round, followed by contestant 9 to 16 in the second round.
Now everyone, let's keep the ball rolling by inviting our first speaker, Ahmad Najib Muhammad from the Institute for Research in Molecular Medicine with his presentation entitled Development of Aptamer-Based Rapid Antigen Test for Typhoid Surveillance. Let's hear from Najib. Ladies and gentlemen, have you ever in your life used rapid antigen tests? Nowadays, rapid antigen tests have become very popular for disease surveillance, especially during pandemic COVID-19. Rapid antigen tests currently use antibody to capture the target antigens. However, antibody has two major limitations. First, antibody is expensive. Second, antibody is easily degradable at higher temperature. In 1990s, researchers have discovered an optamer, which is a unique molecule that can mimic the function of antibody. Optamers have three major advantages over antibody. First, optamers are cheaper. Second, optamers are more stable than antibody. Third, Optamer can be produced easily without the need to use animals. Due to the uniqueness of optamers, in my study, I am developing an optamer-based rapid antigen detection for typhoid fever surveillance. My study involved three phases. First, to get optamers that can specifically bind to the target antigen. Second, to determine which of those optamers bind strongly to the target antigen and finally to develop a prototype and evaluate the prototype accuracy to distinguish typhoid fever, other disease and healthy patients. After successfully isolating 11 optamers, I then check the interaction of these optamers with the target antigen and I found one optamers that binds strongly to the target antigen. So I used these optamers to develop a prototype of rapid antigen test. Then I evaluate the accuracy of this new prototype to check whether or not it cross the act with other disease. In my study, interestingly, I found that this new prototype capable to detect typhoid fever without cross-reactivity with other bacterial diseases. I conclude that my study has successfully developed an optamer-based antigen detection for typhoid fever. This new rapid antigen test will reduce cost of future typhoid surveillance because this new kit is cheaper and also it is more stable at higher temperature. Thank you. Thank you, Najib, for the interesting presentation. Well, the study is basically to develop an aptamer-based rapid antigen detection for typhoid surveillance. I personally look forward to the findings from your research, Najib. Now, without further ado, let me introduce you to our second speaker, Ain Sabrina Mohamad No from the School of Medical Sciences with her presentation entitled The Miraculous Turnaround Conquering Rheumatoid Arthritis Pain with Ivan Prodil. Sounds interesting. Let's hear from Ain. Two years ago, I had a patient who was a kind and lovely granny who studied in a tiny town. She arrived to the hospital with complaining of joint pain and stiffness. As time passed by, the discomfort quickly became painful, making it impossible for her to move freely or perform her everyday duties. After seeking medical consultations, unfortunately, she was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, an illness that affects the joints. Despite going through numerous medical treatments, she still continued to experience discomfort and it seems there was no clear cure for her disease. Rheumatoid arthritis is such a serious healthcare problem that affected millions of people worldwide and it was very challenging for medical researchers to find a solution to stop its progression. So, what is rheumatoid arthritis or RA? 
Rheumatoid arthritis occurs when our own immune system mistakenly attacks healthy tissues in our joints, leading to pain, joint swelling, or stiffness. Treatments at the time help a little bit, but they were not perfect, and many patients still experience intense pain and damage to their joints. What if there are people with RA who faithfully follow their prescribed medication, but despite that, the symptoms, especially the pain, keep coming back? This is so terrifying, right? Okay, how about I tell you that I found such a potential game changer on how to conquer RA pain? My research study is about discovering a potential therapeutic called Ifermodin, in which I conducted on a rat model to mimic RA disease in order to investigate whether it can positive results to the RA pain. In the meantime, we found that Ifermodin works by targeting a specific and important receptor named unmetal d aspartic 2 b which is in fact the main culprit to the development of persistent pain as well as joint swelling. Good news is, by stopping this receptor from being stimulated, Ifermodin effectively reduces the excessive joint swelling and persistent pain. Since it is capable of slowing down further damage to the joint, this drug potentially improves the quality of life for individuals affected from RA because the pain may fade away. It's interesting to note that Ifermodin is currently being tested in phase 2 clinical trials by a global pharmaceutical company to determine whether it has any effects on other types of disorders. The new thing we found might make Ifermodin even more helpful as a treatment and could be a good option for managing pain in chronic arthritis. However, further research and multiple stages of trial must be successfully completed before this medication can be employed as an analgesic for RA pain in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ayn, for the interesting presentation. The research study basically is about discovering a potential therapeutic called Ivan Prodil, in which uh, she conducted on a rat model to mimic RA disease. Since uh, it is capable of slowing down further damage to the joints, this drug potentially improves the quality of life for individuals affected from RA because the pain may fade away. Wow, sounds interesting. All the best, Ayn. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now let's hear from our third speaker, Ali Qureshi, a candidate from the School of Pharmaceutical Sciences, with his presentation, Obesity and COVID-19. Let's hear from Ali. Hello everyone, I'm Ali Kureshi from the School of Pharmaceutical Sciences, University Science, Malaysia. And today I'm going to present something very important related to the health. May I know how many of you really like junk food like pizzas and burgers and certain other kind of processed foods? May I know how many of you really love to spend their layered time in front of their television screen eating popcorn with a glass of juice or soda in their hand? May I know how many of you work more than six hours a day in front of their laptop screens and at the same time I would like to know that how many of you really love to do physical workout 35 to 45 minutes a day I know these questions are a bit surprising but if we individually ask these questions from ourselves we may protect ourselves from one of the deadliest conditions in the world that is obesity Obesity is the excessive body fat or excessive adipose tissues present in our body. In other words, it is the increase in the body mass index more than the normal range. Obesity is increasing day by day globally. More than it has been reported that above 2 million people around the globe are affected by the hazardous complications of obesity. At the same time, we are facing one of the most harmful pandemic conditions in the world, that is COVID-19. So our research is all about the impact of obesity in COVID-19 patients. And the results were very shocking and very alarming for us. It was reported and it was analyzed that those patients who need mechanical ventilation among those patients, the obese patients were 18 times more likely to receive mechanical ventilation as compared to non-obese patients. 
and the same time those patients who were obese were two times twofold more likely to the death as compared to the non-obese subjects or non-obese patients. So this really is very alarming for all of us. And this really let us think about that if really we love ourselves, we love our uh, family, we must think about that life is just given at once. So we must spare some of our time to do physical workout and to protect ourselves from obesity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ali. Shukran, shukran. So basically, his research is about the association of obesity with mechanical ventilation, mortalities, and survival rate in COVID-19. Good luck, Ali. Moving on to our fourth presenter, we bring to you Farha Muhammad from the Advanced Medical and Dental Institutes to present her studies in a presentation entitled Modeling of Sepsis Acute Kidney Injury. The floor is yours, Farha. When germs get into a person's body, they can cause an infection. If you don't stop that infection, it can cause sepsis. So, if you have infection and it is not getting better, you should ask your doctor, Doctor, could this infection be leading to sepsis? If yes, you must be worried. Based on the ICU Malaysia Registry in 2017, sepsis was the most common diagnosis leading to ICU admission in 2017. It affects between 47 and 50 million people every year. At least 11 million die. One death every 2.8 seconds because of sepsis. Depending on country, mortality varies between 15 and more than 50%. Many surviving patients suffer from the consequences of sepsis for the rest of their life because sepsis leads to organ dysfunction. One of the organs that can be affected is kidney and resulting in sepsis-associated acute kidney injury, sepsis AKI. It was found that around 40 to 50% of ICU patients have sepsis AKI. Other research also has found AKI incident has increased by 2.8% per year. The number of patients with sepsis AKI is likely continue to increase. Clinically, AKI is assessed from the serum creatinine and urine output using guidelines from Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes, KDIGO, KDGO. But at the observation time of it, filtration rate in kidney may potentially recover or still depress, and the blood culture result typically take one to two days. So actually, the real time of filtration rate is unavailable to determine the kidney function. At the end, the treatment for AKI might be less accurate. Meanwhile, to diagnose sepsis, clinicians need to use sequential organ failure assessment, or we call it as SOFA, S-O-F-A. Actually, SOFA is used to predict mortality and not the real-time sepsis stage. This problem causes a delay in treating sepsis and worsen the patient condition. Sepsis can rapidly lead to tissue damage, organ failure, and death. Apart from that, it also lengthens the hospital admission and a high treatment cost. So, this is where my expert is needed. I'm going to develop a model specialized for both sepsis AKI. With the right calculation and modeling, the delay can be avoided. This model will help clinicians in diagnosis and provide treatment effectively and efficiently, thus shorter the length of stay and reduce the treatment cost. I'm Farha. Saving others' life through mathematical modeling is my priority. Thank you. Thanks, Farha, for a very insightful presentation. Basically, the primary objective of this study is to establish the true time AKI stage in sepsis. This is because of the mortality rate is very high in patients with sepsis-induced acute kidney damage. No current, uh, no current score can identify sepsis AKI in real time. So, all the best, Farha. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's move to our next presenter, Farhana Sadia from the School of Medical Sciences to deliver her presentation entitled Fat for Wound Healing Treatment. We welcome Farhana Sadia. Non-healing wound is the reflection of an enormous clinical burden. Isn't it a miracle? 
If any part of the human body can heal the whole body, let's look at the formation of human body. During fourth gestational month of the body, brown fat develops, which is truly amazing in maintaining metabolic homeostasis in newborn. By the time being, body losses most of this fat and feelings of shivering starts in cold temperature. But every change has its own replacement. Likewise, as body is growing old and starts taking more calories, which are stored as a savings energy in the form of white fat, also called white adipose tissue. So please have no worries if you have fat buildup, you might need it as a spare part later on, but please keep it at a necessary level. It's about more than 100 years ago that the plastic surgeon discovered the use of fat tissue as a filler to correct the defect due to trauma. And recently there is an advancement in utilizing fat for other purposes in the medical field. As some of you may know, fat tissue enriches with various cells, including stem cells, growth factors, matrix, collagen, and so on. Therefore, this tissue is recognized as one of the potential candidates to be used in the medical field. Not just that, the fat itself can be decellularized and be used as a scaffold. However, repeated grafting are often needed to achieve an optimal outcome, which is ultimately leads to higher cost, donor side morbidity, and patient discomfort. Hence, cryopreservation of adipose tissue and its stem cells can bring light to solve the issue. But switching on the light isn't so easy. For my study, the fat and stem cells will be cryopreserved at certain duration. In this research, the optimized temperature, cryoprotective agents, freezing duration, and thawing are crucial to ensure cell viability as well as membrane integrity in the freezing and thawing cycle for future clinical use of wound healing. Moreover, to minimize the cost and ethical issue rise due to the use of enzymes in clinical treatment, the study is also working for generating a non-enzymatic isolation of cryopreserved adipose tissue. Cryopreservation is necessary to maintain the viability of fat before, before further use, as sometimes we receive an abundance of fat tissue. That's why we decided the cryopreservation of fat and stem cells. We are also trying to use it as an allograft for needy patient in future. By using the preserved adipose tissue and its dynamic stem cells, imagine that the body can top up the own defects itself and donate to others as well. Thanks for Hannah for the interesting presentation. Wow, very interesting. Fat for wound healing treatment. Hmm. Based on her study, the fat and stem cells will be cryopreserved at certain duration. In this research, the optimized temperature, cryoprotective agents, freezing duration, and sewing are crucial to ensure cell viability as well as membrane integrity in the freezing and sewing cycle for future clinical use of wound healing. Good luck for Hana. Well, everyone, let's keep the ball rolling. Let us now hear from our next presenter, Gan Shinji, a candidate from the Institute for Research in Molecular Medicine, which will be presenting a presentation entitled Characterization of Recombinant Immunoglobulin G Binding Protein, FC Gamma R2A for a versatile biosensor development. We welcome Gan Shinji. Have you ever experienced the profound loss of a loved one that the unexpected departure leaving you shattered? During the COVID-19 pandemic, I stood outside the hospital room, racing to visit a cherished person. All I heard was the continuous beeping sound from a machine, a sound that will forever haunt me. That moment underscored the pressing need for early diagnosis, highlighting the, the role of an efficient diagnostic system in preventing such a heart-wrenching moment. Amidst the challenges we face today, a glimmer of hope emerges through the development of a flexible diagnostic platform, a project that I am deeply involved in. Allow me to illustrate this concept by using a simple analogy. Imagine the diagnostic platform as a fishing adventure. The key player here is the antibodies. Think of it as a fish. This fish shed like white 
with its base representing its head, and the top counterpart are the fish tails, detecting the harmful invader. To make our fishing adventure more effective, we introduced a spatial bait called FC receptor, called onto the sensing surface. The fish, attracted by this bait, will align themselves into the Y-shaped orientation. This alignment will significantly enhance the sensitivity, allowing the fish tail to capture any bacteria or viruses. But what is truly fascinating is that, by immobilizing different types of fish, Using the same bait, we can detect a wide range of bacteria or viruses in our samples. This means that we can rapidly and accurately identify the specific disease affecting a patient or even rule out various diseases that might be a concern. The diagnostic journey doesn't stop here. The flexible platform also offers insights into the disease monitoring and stage identification. The bacteria or viruses captured by the fish tail can be quantified through signal analysis, indicating the disease progression. Imagine the transformative impact of such a system on our healthcare landscape. It can significantly expedite the diagnosis process, enabling the clinician to swiftly implement the more suitable treatment strategies. In conclusion, this flexible diagnostic platform is not just a scientific endeavor. It is a lifeline. It holds the promise to save countless lives. As we reflect on the loss we face, let us be inspired by the potential of new solutions to reshape our healthcare future. I believe that this effort can transform the painful beeping sound into the hopeful hum of progress. Thank you. Thank you, Gan Shiyu, for the interesting presentation. This research characterized the FC gamma receptor's role in enhancing antibody orientation on the sensing surface. It introduced a flexible diagnostic platform to enhance sensitivity for rapid and precise disease identification and disease monitoring. This technology has the potential to revolutionize healthcare by accelerating diagnosis and refining treatment strategies promising a hopeful future. Thank you and all the best, Gan Shin Yi. We now welcome the seventh contestant, Gu Yan Rong from the Advanced Medical and Dental Institute in Science category to present her presentation entitled Immune Cell as Defender Save the Lung, Save Our Life. Gu Yan Rong, the floor is yours. Luckily, we are recovering from the terrible global epidemic, COVID-19. We are fortunate to be here, alive and well enough to talk about this today. Some unfortunate people, even our beloved, has gone forever because of this pandemic. Painful memories. However, there are many less fortunate people is suffering from long COVID-19. For a long time after infection, they may feel fatigue, shortness of breath, headache, and they got lung fibrosis. Lungs bring us trouble again. So my PhD research project is focusing on lung disease, immunological studies of lung fibrosis. It's important to know that lung fibrosis is not only caused by virus, it also induced by environment pollutants, smoking, and other diseases. It's the result of field repair. When the lung infected with germs, virus, or exposed to pollutants, the immune system starts to work. Kinds of immune cells defense and work in collaboration with each other. Some of them swallow directly, some deliver message, and some of the message that takes a gun shoot. This collaboration is essential for maintaining the health of the lungs. We remove specific immune cells in the gene at most model, then analyze the functional shifts in other immune cells. We found fascinating interactions between T cells and macrophages during lung fibrosis. But how these two types of immune cells interact with each other? What's going on with them? 
at once the things that are as sequencing technology is helping us to better uncover this amazing phenomenon. If transcriptal level sequencing provides us with a microscopic map, then single cell transcriptal level sequencing is like a more advanced camera gave us a high resolution, high definition image of each cell. This unlocked codes inform us about their identities and responses. Say, the immune factory in our lungs is working. One day, we can make them more effective at fighting disease. Immune cells, we are our defenders. Save the lungs, save our lungs. Xie Xie Gu Yan Rong for the insightful presentation. So, her research focuses on the roles of immune cells in the pathogenesis of lung fibrosis disease. To explore the crosstalk between macrophage and T cell in experimental idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis using gene editing mo mouse model. So, all the best to you, Gu Yan Rong. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let us now listen to our next speaker from the Advanced Medical and Dental Institute, Hamida Muhammad Zain, with a presentation entitled Propolis Liposome, Extinguishing the Inflammation Flame. We welcome Hamida. The floor is yours. Have you ever hurt yourself in a way that you accidentally cut your fingers or stub your toes and then you notice redness, swelling and pain at that particular spot? Well, these are the cardinal signs of inflammation. Inflammation is an ancestral force that evolved to protect us from pathogens. Under normal circumstances, inflammation is short-lived. A few days later, the cut heals, the redness fades and the swelling diminishes. Yet, too much of it can hurt rather than heal. This type of inflammation works in silence and starts damaging the healthy tissues, feed on tumors, and leave the jaw open for illness and disease, including the cardiovascular disease, cancer, as well as the biggest nightmare that the whole world faced for the past three years, the COVID-19. With the knowledge of how inflammation works, me and my research team evaluated the anti-inflammatory properties of stingless bee propolis in an optimized liposomal formulation using a simplified model of human macrophages derived from a leukemic monocyte cells, THP1. Propolis, which is known as a defender of the hive, is a natural product that helps guard the beehive and keeps the germs out. By being characterized as having more than hundreds of beneficial compounds, including flavonoids, phenolic acids and vitamins, we have found that these chemical compounds have profound antioxidant property that help support our immune system and combat against free radical damage. Thus, we evaluated how this work of nature helps suppress inflammation and inhibit the growth of human macrophage. The findings revealed that propolis encapsulated with liposome synergized the activity of propolis with a less toxic effect on the human macrophage, as compared to propolis alone in its natural form. This nanotechnology application reduced the scale of the particles to nano size and protect the bioactive contents of propolis from oxidation and degradation in the acidic pH of the stomach microenvironment thereby improving the bioavailability, stability, and therapeutic index of the active ingredient. The simplified model of human macrophages, on the other hand, provided a reasonable model to mimic how this liposomal propolis acts to fight inflammation upon infection in the actual human macrophages. These shed new light to put off the wild flame of inflammation earlier to prevent it from eating us out Two ashes. Thank you. Hamida Hamida for the insightful presentation. Her study aimed to encapsulate propolis with liposome to synergize the activity of propolis with a less toxic effect on the human macrophage. Okay, 
Ladies and gentlemen, now we have heard the first eight speakers for science category. So now I will pass to Anna for the next round. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as Azza mentioned before, we had listened to the first eight speakers and now we continue with another eight contenders. We will start with Harishini Anapompan Raja Ratinam from the School of Health Sciences to deliver her talk about discovering the bridge between breast cancer and the immune system via liquid biopsy. In order to roam freely in the highways, we need to carry proper documentation and our identification cards so that we don't get caught by the JPG officers or higher authorities. Similarly, our healthy cells carry proper identification codes or self-antigens that are recognized by the immune system, which also acts as the defense system of the body. In another scenario, Cancer cells roam freely in the bloodstream until they get caught by the immune system as the identification codes that they carry are not approved. These identification codes carried by cancer cells are known as cancer-associated antigens. There are plenty of hazardous antigens carried by various types of cancer cells. Once caught, the immune system produces antibodies in order to neutralize these cancer antigens. In my PhD thesis, I have set my objective on a particular cancer antigen known as neonatal NAV 1.5. Neonatal NAV 1.5 has been found to encourage the development of aggressive breast cancer subtypes. Such finding was previously discovered via tissue biopsy. Tissue biopsy is a highly invasive procedure whereby a hollow core biopsy needle pierces through our soft breast tissue in order to obtain samples. In some cases, it may require anesthesia. As a woman, I understand how scary and painful that experience must be. Unfortunately, tissue biopsy can only detect localized neonatal NAV 1.5 antigen and not a circulating form. My PhD work takes an innovative turn whereby we utilize the simple liquid biopsy technique in order to detect the presence of circulating neonatal NAV 1.5 antigen in the whole blood. Such use of simple liquid biopsy technique only requires a tiny needle that pierces through the veins in our arms. As an added advantage of using liquid biopsy, we could also detect the presence of circulating anti-neonatal NAV 1.5 antibody in the serum. The serum acts as a part of the whole blood as well. In short, the detection of both circulating neonatal NAV 1.5 antigen and its antibody may assist in the future as potential screening tool in order to detect the presence of breast cancer metastasis. Thank you. Thank you, Harishini. It's good to know the impact of your research in bridging the immune system and detections of breast cancer progression via liquid biopsy, which is an alternative method to the traditional use of tissue biopsy. Then we will continue with Heng Wui Liang from Center for Chemical Biology to present his research on fastest bacterial predator and its potential application to combat shrimp pathogenic bacteria. When we talk about predation, the first things that come to mind are lions or perhaps tigers preying on deer, as you often see in the National Geography documentaries. 
But did you know that bacteria also prey on other bacteria? Yes, some bacteria do kill and eat other bacteria, and they are known as bacteria predator. Bacteria predator can be found in various environments. However, they constitute only a small group of bacteria. Nowadays, bacteria predator have gained interest among scientists. This is because bacteria predator can be used to kill harmful pathogenic bacteria, especially since antibiotic resistant bacteria have become a serious threat to human. Not long ago, our laboratory obtained a bacteria predator that can kill a stream pathogenic bacteria. This stream pathogenic bacteria can cause severe disease outbreak in stream farms, leading to serious economic losses. While the existing methods are not effective in eradicating this stream pathogen, our bacteria predator emerges as a promising candidate to solve this problem. Our bacteria predator is long and has a spiral shape, making them look like a snake under the microscope. Indeed, during predation, they behave like a snake, crawling towards its prey and then killing it. Other non-bacteria predator takes several minutes to kill their prey. However, our bacteria predator takes only few seconds to kill the stream pathogen. Hence, it is no exaggeration at all to say that our bacteria predator is the fastest bacteria predator ever reported. Under the high magnification electron microscopy, it was observed that the stream pathogens were broken into smithereens. These results have motivated us to identify the deadly weapon used to kill the stream pathogen. Gene analysis has shown that our bacteria predator contains several genes related to bacterial degradation. These genes could be the arsenal of weapons used by our bacteria predator during predation. In conclusion, our bacteria predator is the fastest bacteria predator ever reported. Our bacteria predator can be used to eradicate this harmful bacteria from stream farming, reducing the economic losses caused by this pathogen. Additionally, the deadly weapon used by our bacteria predator can be used as a therapeutic agent, replacing antibiotic in treating aquaculture diseases caused by this harmful bacterium or other related bacteria. Thank you. Thank you, Heng Wei Liang. I believe by understanding the predation mechanism, it could enable us to fully harness its potential for eradicating the shrimp pathogen at shrimp cultivation farm in the future. Next, let's welcome Joseph Ui Boon Han from the School of Physics to present his work on numerical analysis of his detection model using horizontal scanning LIDAR. What comes to mind when you hear the word haze? Bad air quality, poor visibility, PM or particulate matter? Haze is common in countries with high levels of air pollutants. As Malaysians, we have our fair share of haze. During the haze episode of 2015, the peak concentration of PM 2.5 was five times higher than usual. At sizes smaller than the width of your hair, PM 2.5 and PM 10 are abundant in haze and pose severe health risks to the public. While air quality monitoring stations are capable of measuring PM levels to detect haze, light detection and ranging, better known as LIDAR, has emerged as a promising new tool to monitor aerosols and haze due to its faster detection, superior range, and range resolved readings. LiDAR signals are obtained from the scattering of laser pulses off of aerosols. Since regions of high aerosol concentrations can be deduced from the LiDAR signal, vertical scanning LiDARs that point towards the sky have been used to detect aerosol layers that develop in the atmosphere during haze. But isn't haze all around us? Doesn't that make vertical scanning LiDARs sort of inefficient? Indeed, horizontal scanning LiDARs, in theory, should do a better job at detecting haze. However, they are relatively new 
and have not yet been used in haze detection. This is where my work comes in. My research focuses on theoretical frameworks for haze detection using horizontal scanning LIDARs. I introduce new theory on how one can design horizontal scanning LIDARs and models that analyze their readings to detect haze. From simulations, I found that using multiple scattering theory, horizontal scanning LIDARs could be used to characterize haze up to moderate levels and any corrections related to humidity could be done using regression analysis. Furthermore, this LiDAR haze detection model could be applied to any horizontal scanning LiDAR or climate. This is the first step to faster haze detection measures, and by laying the theoretical foundation, it is my hope that this will lead to gradual adoption of horizontal scanning LiDARs which will build up a network of local and even regional haze monitoring systems. Now that's something to look forward to. Thank you, Joseph. For me, your topic is one of the critical topics as haze frequently happens in Malaysia, and it may pose a significant threat to human. Thus, by introducing of horizontal scanning LIDAR, it may not only improve haze monitoring, but also mitigation. Next, let's welcome Kasturi Anak Perempuan Selvam from Institute for Research in Molecular Medicine to share her research about development of DNA aptamers for the detections of B. pseudomale toward diagnosis of melodosis. Ladies and gentlemen, have you ever heard of melidosis? It is not a well-known disease, but it is an important one. Melidosis is an infectious disease caused by a bacterium known as Burgundia pseudomale. This bacterium frequently found in wet soil and muddy water. Therefore, people who live closer to the soil, especially the farmers and individuals who have underlying conditions, mainly type 2 diabetes mellitus are the high risk group for melidosis. Melidosis is endemic in Malaysia. Unfortunately, melidosis often goes unnoticed and lead to high mortality rate. This is because the challenges in the diagnosis of melidosis itself. Culture is the gold standard for the detection of Burgadera pseudomale. However, it is a time consuming procedure which will delay the treatment and result in loss of many lives. So, what should we do to save all those lives? Here, my PhD comes to create a fast and easy test to detect Burgadera pseudomale from the patient samples. This could help doctors to detect the melidosis early and start the treatment as fast as possible. A biomarker has been selected for my research known as BIBD, Burgadera Invasion Protein D. It is surface protein of Burgadera pseudomale and exposed outside which will allow the ligand to bind to it easily. To detect this biomarker, I have successfully isolated an aptomer. Aptomer is nucleic acid-based ligand that function as antibodies. However, aptomers have several advantages over the antibodies, such as cost-effective in terms of production and more stable. To make it the test rapid, which will take only 15 minutes, electrochemical-based detection of biomarker using aptoma will be developed which will similar to the glucose by sensor. This test can be utilized in rural areas where there is no requirement of advanced equipment and specialized staff. If there are patients suspected for melidosis, their sample will be tested for the presence or absence of biomarker to rule out whether the patients are positive or negative for melidosis. And the significance of my PhD is to save many lives by detecting melidosis early, provide the patient right treatment sooner, and ultimately decrease the mortality rate of melidosis. Thank you. Thank you, Kasturi. Yes, indeed, melidosis is a severe and often fatal disease, especially prevalent in tropical regions. Hence, by developing a rapid and cost-effective point-of-care test, it is a critical step 
in combating this disease effectively. We will now proceed with our next presenter, Manahil Makbul from the School of Dental Sciences. She will share her research on the dentinal trials. Ow, my tooth hurts. I think I'm having a tooth decay, or as the dentist might call it, caries? Yes, they do. Dental caries is a very common problem affecting one in four adults. Caries travels from the hard tissue of the tooth, called as the enamel, into the second layer, the dentine, and finally the blood vessels of the tooth, which are called as the dental pulp. It is important to note that once a carious exposure has taken place, that amount of dentine which still remains to protect the dental pulp is called as the remaining dentine thickness. Me and my team have worked on introducing a novel diagnostic tool which we like to call as the dentinal triage. This triage is very similar to a medical triage as it has zones Categor which categorize remaining dentine thickness as per the urgency to treat that tooth. The green zone has a thicker remaining dentine thickness protecting the pulp. The yellow zone has a moderately thinner layer than the green zone. And finally, the red zone has a very slim layer of remaining dentine thickness and of course requires urgent attention by your dentist to treat it. How can this diagnostic tool be used? Well. Once you visit your dentist and he or she takes a dental x-ray of the tooth which hurts, they can easily measure that remaining dentine thickness just above the dental pulp. After measuring that thickness, they can see where in our diagnostic tool, the dentinal triage, that thickness falls, the green zone, the yellow zone, or the red zone. Based on that, our diagnostic tool helps the dentist in making an elaborate treatment plan which can also be used to educate the patient on the prognosis and treatment outcomes. Who can benefit from this diagnostic tool, you might think? Well, not only the dental community, but also the most important part of our community, our patients. As this diagnostic tool has been carefully designed to, make, to, to be made comprehensible and easy for the patients to understand as well. Please, avoid reaching the stage of an ouch and visit your dentist before caries goes beyond the red zone of the dentinal triage. Thank you. Thank you, Manahil. I believe your research will represent a significant advancement in the field of dentistry and also has the potential to greatly improve patient care and dental education, especially related to the management of deep caries. Next, we have Noor Ain Fatiha from the School of Dental Sciences to share her work on From Waste to a Wonderful Filler in Flowable Composite. Our work produces an astounding amount of waste, and agricultural waste is a significant part of it. One example of such waste is rice husk. During the milling process of rice, the husk is removed to obtain the edible rice grain. Each year, millions of tons of rice husks are discarded as waste, contributing to environmental pollution and waste management issues. In fact, the rice husk alone accounts for about one-fifth of the world's annual rice production waste. Surprisingly, researchers have discovered that rice husk contains a significant amount of silica and the extraction process is simple, safe and environmentally friendly. The silica derived from rice husk has found its application in various industries, including dentistry. Its introduction into dental industry promises significant advantages. From this breakthrough in my study, I used this silica extracted from rice husk, which is nano-hybrid in size, as a valuable filler to develop a new flowable composite. Besides the nano-hybrid silica as the main filler, zirconium oxide is also incorporated into this newly developed flowable composite to enhance the radio opacity effects radiographically. This newly developed flowable composite is subsequently subjected to physical-mechanical tests 
to ensure its properties meet the desirable characteristic of dental restorative materials. So where does this global composite is applied? Now imagine you have a small hole or cavity in one of your teeth. To fix it, dentists might use global composite as it can easily be injected and flow nicely into the intended site. The dentist will use it as a restorative material to repair those little holes of your teeth, making sure it covers the damaged area perfectly. This only takes a few seconds and after that, your tooth will all be patched up and good as new. The transformation of rice husk into nanohybrid silica and subsequently into a greener floral composite exemplifies the power of waste to wealth. It is hoped that the use of nanohybrid silica as filler from rice husk in this study produce a comparable floral composite that can meet the standard requirement and demonstrate acceptable clinical performance that is cost effective and support our green industry's growth. This promising product can be commercialized, marketed within the country and even better, exported all over the world to develop a successful business network. Hence, Malaysia will be recognized as a hub for dental clinical research. Thank you. Thank you, Nur Ain. So her research highlights the importance of circular economy in which about turning agriculture waste, especially rice husk, into nanohybrid silica, which is a crucial ingredient in dental restorative materials. I believe this innovative approach will not only reduce waste, but also has the potential to enhance the quality of dental materials in the market. Okay, now we proceed with our second last presenter, which is Tengku Muhammad Asri from the School of Health Sciences. He will present his topic, which is about the developments of We Care program enhancing life of community dwelling older people. Good day everyone. Imagine a future where the golden years of our life are not defined by limitation but by vitality and purpose. I am Tengku Asri Tengku Maktar and today I am here to unveil a solution that can transform how we approach aging. As we age, the challenges we face can be daunting. Picture a scenario where heart declines and daily activities become a struggle. It's a reality we all may encounter. Introducing the We Chara program, a visionary initiative designed to empower community dwelling older people. Built on an occupational based concept, We Chara aims to not only maintain but also elevate the quality of life for our older people. What set We Chara apart is embrace of our Malaysian culture values. We have carefully crafted a program that resonates with our elderly, recognizing their unique needs and aspirations. By doing so, we are fostering a journey through aging that's dignified and fulfilling. The impact is profound. All the adults participating in WeChara experience a renewed vigor and meaningful engagement. They are not just maintaining their independence, but they are thriving within their communities. As an example of personal story of one case study that involved in this program, Pakcik Ahmad, 72 years old man, a pension government staff, is profound participant participant in Wichara. His journey from isolation to active involvement embodies the essence of our program. Through Wichara, he rediscovered his sense of purpose and reaching his life and those around him. But we are not stopping here. We are envisioning a future where the Wichara program become a cornerstone of societal well-being. As we extend and refine, more older people will experience the transformation. Let's remember, aging is a shared experience. An inevitable path we will enter. Together, we can reshape this journey. Support initiatives like WeChara and let's forge a future where aging is synonym with dignity and fulfillment. In conclusion, the development of WeChara program is not just about enhancing life, 
it's about revolution how we approach empty by empower our elders we are contributing to healthier more vibrant society thank you assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh thank you tengku muhammad asri for me your research is very significant as it directly address the unique needs of our aging population in malaysia I look forward to the positive impact of your program in upgrading the life of our seniors. We now reach our last presenter for today, which is Wan Nur Hidayah from the School of Medical Sciences. She will present her research about promising amphiphilic smart glyco nanostructure for therapeutic nanocarrier through environmentally friendly approach PISA. Our daily life is highly associated with the use of polymers, for example, plastics. But we are not aware of their other amazing uses on nanoscales. Polymer nanoobjects are incredibly small, around 20 times larger than a water molecule, but 1000 times smaller than a hair strand. This nanoscale polymer can be used to encapsulate, protect and deliver the ingredients to the desired target. With specific modifications and carefully designed, these polymer nanoobjects can be used to defeat cancer. Cancer is something that needs to be talked about openly without any fear because there is hope. There are countless of researchers around the world work every day to find better ways to battle this disease and I am one of them. So what do we do? My work is mainly focused on the synthesis and development of the stable and smart functionalized nanoobjects which aim to be used as nanocarriers. These nanoobjects are made up of copolymers. They are amphiphilic which they have both hydrophilic saccharide part and also hydrophobic synthetic part. We exploited the tumor acidic pH so that our nanoobjects exhibited the pH responsive properties. We manufactured these nanoobjects using environmentally friendly technique called PISA. This technique only uses water as for the solvent, no organic solvent, which is good. The best way to imagine these nanoobjects is as sponges so they can suck up the anti cancer drugs into their pores and release them only when they reach the targeted site, which is the cancer environment. Even cancer cells and normal cells look similar, but they do have differences. And these differences, the nanoobjects can recognize them before they release the payloads. How they recognize? The nanoobjects, the system is designed to have special spikes on their surfaces so that they can bind to the unique cell surface proteins that express on the cancer cells before they release the drugs. The problem with nanocarriers, once they enter the bloodstream, they tend to fall apart really quick and release the drugs earlier, everywhere. What we are trying to do is we want to produce the sturdy nanoobjects so that these nanoobjects are stable enough to sustain during their delivery to the targeted site. So far, we managed to produce the nanoobject with specific properties and we need further investigation for, to clarify the mechanism of drug release. We hope that in the future, we can use these nanoobjects for biomedical applications and we really hope for a better future. Thank you. Thank you, Wan Nur Hidayah. Your work is very interesting as it involves the developments of nanoobjects based on biocompatible and biodegradable polysaccharide to fight against cancer. For me, it is an innovative and forward-thinking approach that has the potential to bring about significant advancement in the field of healthcare and drug delivery. Okay, now we are coming to the end. Again, thank you to all contenders. And before we announce the winner for each category, we are going to have a short break for five minutes. Our judges will deliberate the result and be back with us in a short while. While waiting, let's enjoy the video prepared by the MPRC.
The greatest threat to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. Sustainability is no longer an option. It is now an obligation. USM has the mission of transforming higher education for a sustainable tomorrow. With each step taken, USM will always lead the move in matters regarding sustainability. USM pioneers the path in implementing the Accelerated Program for Excellence, known as APEX. As the nation's sole APEX university, USM is placed fourth in the Global World Impact Rankings. APEX supports intensive transdisciplinary research efforts which can empower communities. APEX transforms socioeconomic well-being. APEX empowers the strategic quadruple helix collaborative network. APEX gives rise to hebat talents that are prominent, excellent, and eminent.
With each passing moment, there is continual aspiration to be the sustainability-led university. USM is committed towards advancing a sustainable future. Our home is not just USM. Our home is much bigger. Next, we would like to invite our Chief Jury, Dr. Nur Azalia Kamaruzaman, to give her comments and advice to all contenders. Everyone, let's welcome Dr. Nur Azalia. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good day to everyone. The 3 Minute Thesis Competition celebrates the exciting research conducted by PhD students and challenges them to present a compelling oration on their thesis topic in a language appropriate to a non-specialist audience. An 80,000 word PhD thesis will usually take about 9 hours to present, but in this competition, the time limit is just 3 minutes, hence the name 3 Minute Thesis Competition. Sounds impossible, but you have made it possible. Today, we come together not just to recognize winners, but also to acknowledge the effort perseverance and commitment displayed by each and every participant. I would like to extend my heartfelt congratulations to all the participants who have taken part in USM 3MT competition. Your dedication, hard work and passion have brought you to this moment and it's a privilege to celebrate your achievements. This competition is not just about winning, it is about personal growth, learning and the sense of accomplishment that comes from pushing your own boundaries. You've had the courage to step out of your comfort zones, put yourself out there and strive for excellence and for that, you should be immensely proud of yourselves. You have wowed us judges with your performance, confidence and impactful research and it had been a wonderful and enlightening experience to be able to watch and learn from your unique and exciting research work. Some of you might have joined voluntarily, some might have been a little bit encouraged by your supervisors. Whether you achieved your desired outcome or faced challenges along the way, remember that participation itself is a victory and your presence here today is a testament to your determination and resilience. USM thanks you for your passion, courage and support. If you don't win this time around, don't let that hamper your spirit. Remember that your experience is invaluable and always strive to learn the good from others, identify your own weaknesses, improve yourself and most importantly, try again next year. Some common areas of improvement that we've pronunciation of words during the presentation. Your work is great and beneficial, so make sure that you tell the world about it. Lastly, on behalf of the judges, Professor Dr. Dr. Faiza Rafiq Mama Adikan and Professor Dr. Jamila Haji Ahmad, I would like to take a moment to express our deepest thanks to the incredible team from IPS. Dean, Deputy Dean, and the FPS Secretary team, as well as PTPM Creative Media Production for organizing yet another successful and exciting USM 3MT competition. Without their tireless dedication, hard work, and meticulous planning, none of this today would have been possible. Thank you. I wish you all the best. Thank you, Dr. Nur Azalia, for the insightful comments. Now, I would like to welcome our honourable guest, Professor Dato Geospecialist Dr. Narima Samad, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic and International, for the closing remarks. Everyone, let's welcome Yang Rubahagia, Professor Dato. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and a very good morning. Our distinguished guests, 
deans, directors, USM staff and students, and our outstanding contestant of USM 3-Minute Thesis Competition 2023. Ladies and gentlemen, first and foremost, on behalf of the University of Science Malaysia, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the annual University of Science Malaysia 3-Minute Thesis Competition 2023, organized by the Institute of Postgraduate Studies, USM. Similar to last year, this competition is again hosted and attended virtually by the juries, attendees and contestants. Ladies and gentlemen, 3-Minute Thesis is a research com communication competition first developed by the University of Queensland in 2008 and now has gained worldwide acceptance in more than 18 countries including Malaysia. This competition is also supported by the Malaysian Council of Deans of Graduate Studies and this year marks the 8th edition of our participation and organisation of this competition at USM level. This competition is significant to USM as it brings together brilliant and outstanding PhD researchers from various disciplines in one special platform. Presenting in a three-minute thesis competition increases the student capacity to effectively explain their research in three minutes in a language appropriate to a non-specialist audience. Today, we have the opportunity to listen to interesting presentation from different research areas and to appreciate each and every research effort and scientific finding that they have presented to us. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I really hope this program will become the catalyst for USM students to discover more ideas and to promote the scientific research findings to the USM community and the society at large. Before I end this speech, I would like to express my utmost gratitude and appreciation to IPS, PTPM, and the juries for making this virtual event a success. To all the three-minute thesis contestants, I would like to wish you all the best and good luck in today's competition. Thank you. Thank you, Yang Berbahagia Professor Dato, for your speech. Next, we have come to the most awaited moment. We are going to announce the result for each category. The first category is Engineering and Technology. Third place goes to Chia Yitong from the School of Chemical Engineering. Then, for the second place, it goes to Nor Huda Ismail from the School of Materials and Mineral Resources Engineering. Ooh, congrats! And the first place goes to Alexander Tan Wai Tan from the School of Mechanical Engineering. Congratulations to all the winners. Ladies and gentlemen, coming up next, we will announce the winner for the Social Science category. The third place goes to Zaib Eun Nisa from Center for Economic Development Management Studies. Congratulations. Congratulations. Okay, next, another second place goes to Ara Tadim Ed from School of Distance Education. Ooh. Congratulations. And then the first place goes to Vanessa Kasi from School of Educational Studies. Congratulations. Okay, now we proceed with the science category. The third place goes to Manahil Makbu from the School of Dental Sciences. Congratulations. Then we have. The second place goes to Wan Nur Hidayah Wan Hanafi from the School of Medical Sciences. Ooh, congratulations. congratulations. 
Then we have the first place. It goes to Hamida Mohaji from Advanced Medical and Dental Institute. Let me to all the winners for the science category. Okay, okay congratulations, congratulations to all the winners. So, and uh, we have now come to the end of the ceremony. I'm Azar and my lovely partner, Anna, would like to thank you for spending your time with us this morning. On behalf of the organizer, we would like to express our million thanks to all participants, School, Centre for Instructional Technology and Multimedia, Institute Postgraduate Studies and those who involved directly and indirectly in these events. All of you who get given a big support and help to run this program successfully, not only for this year, but also previous years. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. <laughs> Hope to see everyone again yeah. next year. Stay safe and Assalamualaikum. Bye. Bye. Bye.